Good afternoon. I want to begin by welcoming all of you to this panel discussion on Ostseepolitik, new German defense strategies and old geopolitical concerns, which is hosted by the Center for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge and the Interdisciplinary Research Center uh, of the Baltic Sea region at the University of Greifswald. Our two universities are members of a Baltic geopolitical network collaborating in trying to promote discussion about geopolitical questions in the Baltic Sea region. And we're delighted at the way this works. And I want to particularly thank in Cambridge, Professor Jen Brendan Sims and John Freeman, and at Greifswald, Margit Bussmann, Alexander Drost, and Andrew Banker, who've worked together to try and bring this together. It's now about the 20th in this series of events, which have been running for just over a year. I'm glad to say that today, we've got a lot of interest in this event, and we're now building a substantial program of other events and activities with a regular newsletter. If you are uh, watching this for the first time, and you haven't yet joined up to us already, please do sign up to receive our regular material. About 50 people have registered for this event. It's an online video panel, which will end at 6 p.m. UK time promptly. I will moderate a discussion with the panelists for the first half hour, and then in the second half, I will relay questions from the audience to our panelists. You as the audience will be able to see and hear both me and the panelists. You will have your microphone and camera switched off automatically, so at no time will you be heard or seen by anybody in this webinar. However, you are still able to communicate with me and the panelists. At the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A option, question and answer option. Click on it, and when it opens, you have the chance to type questions. If you type questions, please start by writing your name and your affiliation first. If your question is for a specific panelist, please state that at the outset as well. I will try to cover as many of your questions as possible, though in view of the numbers and time constraints, it's possible we won't be able to address everyone's question. Finally, I also want to let you know that this video panel is being recorded and we will post the recording on our website over the next few days. Russia's war in Ukraine has fundamentally changed German foreign and security policy in the Baltic Sea region. Not only are the states at the Baltic Rim calling for German military involvement, but also for arms deliveries to Ukraine and a strengthening of European security policy at EU and NATO level. Just this week, there have been major developments on these fronts. In a very short time, Germany under the new federal government led by Chancellor Olaf Scholz has broken with principles rooted in historical responsibility and is strengthening the German NATO mission in Lithuania, providing an additional budget of 100 billion euros for arming the Bundeswehr and supplying weapons to the war zone in Ukraine. What does this change of strategy, a quite fundamental change of strategy mean for German, German policy in the Baltic Sea region? What current expectations of the neighboring countries are being aroused or fulfilled? And to what extent is Germany moving away from its post-war war and post reunification geo to be about. It will be moderated by myself. My name is Charles Clark. I was a minister in Tony Blair's government and now co-lead this program. We have an outstanding panel of Claudia Muller, Margarita Cecil Geiter, and Professor Pierre Frederic Weber. I'll introduce each of them in a moment but yeah, I'm going to ask each of them to talk for about five or five, six minutes uh, to set out their general perspective. I will then promote a discussion with them for another 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will open it to the floor. Our first panelist is Claudia Muller. She's a member of the Bundestag, which is in session at the moment, she's just told me, so the backdrop you see behind her is Berlin, where she is at the moment. She's a de Grunen member of the Bundestag Defense Committee, and of the Baltic Sea Parliamentary Conference in Berlin. She comes from Rostock, where she was at school, and is a member of parliament for Mecklenburg uh, for Pommern. And so obviously very engaged in the politics of many of the controversial issues, not least the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and the decisions being taken around that. 
Claudia, you're on the inside of the governing coalition in Berlin, and I very much look forward to your description of what thinking you think is taking place and how it's all evolving in a rapidly moving situation. So Claudia Muller, we look forward to you. Thank you, Charles. Um, before I start that, I have to say in generally that um, there is quite a difference between the parties when it comes to the look or the view upon the Middle and Eastern European um, situation and politics. And that is not just the current situation, but long before. And I have to take a quick look back to 2017 when we had, uh, well, not yet coalition talks, but the preparation for coalition talks between the uh, CDU, FDP and Alliance 19 the Greens where we already talked about um, the questions as, for example, North Stream 2 and the politics for those for, for the last uh, legislative period would have been different with, different with a different coalition because those parties had a different look upon the issue than um, one major party. And we have seen that um, when it comes to the new government. Um, the view on, to, uh, on that topic in the um, foreign office has changed and that is of course due to the new uh, leadership on that um, of that office. Um, I know Annalena Baerbock for a very long time and we have worked closely together even before we both were in parliament on those issues on European uh, policies and especially with the look onto uh, Middle and Eastern Europe European countries. Um, and one of the main points that has always puzzled me was how little importance was given by the German governments on the views of our um, Baltic neighbors, especially not only the Baltic countries, but also Poland. And all the warnings we have heard before, and which unfortunately has now been proven true, um, how little importance was given to them. To be quite honest, and I can say that because I have, have had that point of view since I have been in politics, and that was long before I was in parliament, of course, is that every threat that we have seen, unfortunately, has been true. And what has changed dramatically this year, and I would not just say not just with the beginning of the war, but also um, with the Russian movements shortly before, and also with the speeches of uh, Putin and Lavrov, where they very much explained, really, what their view on the region is, how they really see the Ukraine, but also the Baltic states, not as actual independent states, but as part of their empire, that we have to take this seriously and we are now taking it seriously. The war in the Ukraine was probably the last blow to everyone that so far had still believed that Putin would not attack, that he would not use military force in that way. Though I have to say that we had seen that before, we had seen it in Georgia, we had seen it in um, Chechnya, we had seen it on the Crimea, of course, but not with such a full blow on such a large country, one has to say. And that has changed our politics dramatically. And also for my party, because you mentioned that um, the question of um, delivering weapons is one that um, was very much, um, that we all, or most parties had the same view on that. We should not give weapons to countries in war. But that was usually meant to countries uh, in a civil war, where it's very difficult to determine um, what is right or wrong, who was taking the first shot, um, who was uh, doing uh, crimes against humanity. Now, this time, it is very clear. It is very visible who is the aggressor, who is uh, defending themselves. And so this time, and um, this is very clear to all of us, really, we have to help those defending themselves. But still, um, the... The main question is how we can do that, not just by delivering weapons, but giving aids in other, other areas, but also, and this is very difficult for us, to become independent from Russia. Because what we have failed within the last decades, really, was to really di diversify and, and really see the question of security, not as a military security, but also um, resilience. And when, when it comes to resilience, that means infrastructure, that means also energy. And we are seeing that how heavily dependent we are in Germany, but also in other European countries, but especially in Germany, on Russian energy imports. And that our infrastructure is not built at the moment to take, other, um, to, to take in other in, uh, imports. And that really proves to be quite a heavy blow on the region now. 
Um, when especially looking to the Baltic Sea and the Baltic Sea region, um, we very much see the threat, especially for the Baltic states now. We see the problem with the Suwalki Corridor, how very vulnerable we are in that region and how important therefore it is to have a strong presence in the Baltic Sea to secure a free passage via the Baltic Sea for us, for our partners, and to make sure that the supplies will always be provided via that bridge. Dependent, we are on a safe Baltic. Therefore, we have moved ships towards the Baltic Sea again. Um, we are enhancing presence in that area. And of course, you mentioned it, we are enhancing presence then also in especially Lithuania. Um, as a member of the Defense Council, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to tell everything, um, obviously, but um, I can as much tell you that all democratic parties, well, except one, all democratic parties are very much in line when it comes to this issue. We need to provide help and all those dreams that some might have had, that, that since we are, uh, dependent on each other and especially Russia being dependent on our payments that that will prohibit them from going to war. We have seen that it simply does not happen. We have seen that we have been wrong in our assessments and we now have to move as quickly as possible to make up for those mistakes, to help become more resilient and also to help that all of the region will be strong enough and will be resilient enough so that Russia will not attack, will not feel that they have a chance attacking any other countries. And let, let me um, finish with the lesson. And of course, help you, Ukraine to, um, to fight back and to maintain their strength. And we are taking on that. And we have also seen at that point that we need to improve our military resilience as well. This has been a extreme change but we're taking it on and the Baltic Sea has become another focus on strategic view of Germany again um, which it should have been I would say the last at least 20 years. Claudia thank you for that tremendous introduction you've raised a whole string of very interesting questions and I'm very glad as well that you've rooted some of your comments Firstly, in the history of what has gone on over the last two or three decades, and I hope that will be reflected through our session, but also in the fact change is happening uh, in Germany at the moment. And so how we deal with that and how we see it is something I hope will emerge in our further contributions. Our second panellist is Margarita Selsel gite She's director of the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University. So is looking from the point of view of a very close neighbor, uh, looking through the whole Baltic Sea region. She's been doing that for some years and has developed an impressive reputation of quality and understanding of the field. And I think I'm right, Margarita, in saying before you were director of the uh, Institute in Vilnius University, you were at the Baltic Defence College uh, in Tallinn. And so she's got a lot of experience looking it all around. We very much look forward, Margarita, to what you'd like to say uh, for this session. Margarita. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be in this uh, distinguished panel and talk about the topic which is uh, very wildly discussed now in Lithuania because uh, suddenly surprising to us, but maybe for Germany as well, Germany had become uh, number one security partner for Lithuania for the years it's, it has been the United States. And now our surveys uh, of public opinion show that the society thinks that Germany is getting this role of the major security partner in Lithuania. So things have changed. And uh, I think that uh, it was step by step uh, uh, path towards the situation what we are having. And um, there was a need for uh, leadership in the European Union in Europe. 
And that was particularly obvious uh, uh, when Trump was the president of the United States. And it was not clear to, if uh, the support of the United States for the European uh, partners, the defense support, security support would remain the same. And uh, the Baltic states, which live in very precarious security situation, security has been vulnerable for the years, were looking around, so who could become this major security partner? Who could lead Europe? And uh, naturally, uh, the eyes were on the UK, but then UK decided to leave the European Union. And then we were left with French and uh, German alternative alternatives. And of course, it was a hard choice, uh, um, although the German leadership in general for the ages had a very good reputation in terms of economical uh, uh, leadership, political leadership. Uh, let's uh, remember the leadership of Angela Merkel, how she was skillfully managing the European Union, uh, well, uh, showing the leadership uh, during the financial crisis, but also uh, negotiating, helping to negotiate uh, uh, new uh, multi-annual financial perspective of the European Union. And therefore, one could uh, hope for a very solid and effective leadership, but not in the field of defense. And we had three major concerns about the potential German leadership or the potential of the German leadership in this particular field, in the field of security and defense. First of all, because we had very divergent positions on Russia, how we see it. Second of all, on energy policy, how we see it and uh, what uh, decision should be made. And third, on the defense, how much how much uh, how de uh, is defense uh, related uh, with the military uh, means or probably military is not so important and probably we do not have to spend 2% and uh, uh, that military conflict is not probably the main challenge in the forthcoming years. Uh, however, in between, uh, while we are looking for this uh, new uh, leadership emerging in Europe uh, after the uh, events in Crimea, I think that Germany made a very important step by taking a decision to become a framework nation, nation of enhanced forward presence battalion in Lithuania. I know that it was not an easy decision and it was rather a political decision uh, than a very premeditated bureaucratic decision. And um, uh, this decision just uh, allowed us to think of Germany as also as a partner, as a potential leader in the region uh, in the security terms. And after, since then, when German uh, troops were sent to Lithuania since 2017, these relations were growing uh, stronger and stronger in terms of procurement, exercises, uh, um, also on the political and economic level. And I think that there was this certain level of trust which has been built over these years and also interoperability, understanding, uh, seeing the threats in a more common way. But again, there were certain you know, insecurities related to A, uh, thinking that, okay, you know, uh, Germany is very much dependent on Russia and if situation uh, uh, energetically in, in the energy field and if situation would change, maybe we could face a scenario that Germany probably would not be so uh, willing to prolong its presence in Lithuania. And again, uh, we are also were thinking that maybe, you know, this unwillingness to invest more in armed forces might hamper ability of Germany to uh, defend the region if a su serious security crisis erupts. And I think that uh, what we see today we see a very positive development. First of all, of course, the situation has changed and German attitude on Russia has changed. 
Second of all, the decision to diversify the sources uh, of energy, uh, uh, to diversify the um, places where the energy resources comes to Germany from, it is also very important when uh, your foreign minister, German foreign minister was in Lithu Lithuania, just I think a week ago, she promised that uh, the Germany would stop buying Russian oil by the end of 2022. So it is a very important signal. I know that it is very difficult to, to Germany, but I think it's a very strong message and very strong commitment. Plus uh, the promise of uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz to spend on defense, to um, uh, give uh, uh, for the defense additional 1 billion euros. It is again, a very important promise. And I think it's, it's just revolutionary change in Germany, which is very, very much help, uh, welcomed. However, I think that some things still to be done and um, one thing, and I know that it's not an easy thing to, to do, is to make the political decision uh, making process faster. Because what we see from our side that uh, the situation in uh, uh, Ukraine is evolving very fast. And the decision making process is uh, somewhat slow. Uh, in terms of providing Ukraine with the arm, arms, with the weapons. And on top of that, there are also very many political, mixed political messages that, for instance, uh, German Chancellor, he is not talking about the slow uh, political process. He's just cutting certain uh, weapons out of the list and saying that we cannot do this. And this sense, again, uh, this mixed political message. So can we trust Germany or it, uh, withdrawing also back to what it was some time ago? And that was only the short term change that we, uh, we, we saw. So I think that these, uh, these trends are a bit uh, um, stressing uh, countries in the, in, in the Baltic, well, Baltic states and countries around. But I, I believe that uh, that is only a temporary, uh, probably, um, challenge. And I very much hope that these trends in the energy policy and in the defense policy will be long-term trends. And that would contribute very much to the changing situation in the region, because you have to bear in mind that with this decision of uh, give additional 1 billion euros to defense, Germany will become the third uh, defense spender in the world by 2024. And that changes the situation. It's gonna become a very, very important player. And uh, we hope that in this situation, uh, Lithuania as a major security department of Germany also we will be uh, able to cooperate uh, in ensuring uh, better security in the region. Margarita, thank you very much for that assessment. Very, very interesting. I thought the overlap between what you were saying, what Claudia was saying, works very well for our discussion. Very interesting. Our third panelist is Professor Pierre Frederic Weber, who's an associate professor at the Institute of History at the University of Stettin. Uh, with a particular interest on Germany's relationships with East and Central Europe after 1945, and he's written widely about German-Polish relations uh, in particular. Uh, Pierre, we're delighted that you can join us th this afternoon. Many thanks for doing so. We look forward to your take uh, on this discussion, which we've uh, started. Pierre. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, and uh, I have the, the privilege and the problem maybe to be the last one, <laughs> to uh, present uh, my points, the privilege, because I could get inspired by uh, the statements that I have uh, uh, heard so far, uh, the problem, because I, I have to uh, find the point to stick it together to some point. Uh, from my perspective as a historian, uh, I would add here uh, a couple of points to, to um, enlarge a bit the, the, the time frame, maybe, uh, the perspective on, on Germany. Um, in fact, I would like to start uh, with, with a, a, a short statement that would 
go like this. In fact, uh, after uh, Second World War, until now, uh, through the evolution, the revolution in some uh, uh, way, we could say Germany went through from uh, Nazism, Nazism to a, a democratic uh, country, a democratic partner of European states. Uh, Europeans in the world got the Germany they wished for themselves. So, so they got uh, Germany that in fact uh, uh, accepted to, uh, uh, well, get rid of a whole certain tradition of militarism and so on, of using military uh, and, 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 and hard powers in order to achieve some goals and so on, which in, in a time like now, <coughs> when hard powers get back, when uh, um, a way uh, of providing international politics <coughs> comes back that we were not used anymore in Europe through European integration and so on, when Russia appears to use uh, methods that we hoped would uh, belong to the past and uh, as we see remain present <coughs> and for the next maybe years, who knows? Well, Germany uh, in uh, a certain way uh, culturally speaking, from, from the political culture, from its, well, let's say, collective habitus as a state uh, uh, and uh, of its decision, its decision makers too, uh, well, uh, is in a situation where it's difficult to get back again to a certain thinking and to, to be prepared for this kind of challenge in some, in some way. So, of course, what we hear uh, from many partners uh, in uh, several parts of Europe, especially in Central Eastern Europe, uh, but uh, also in Western Europe, maybe some kind of, uh, well, uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, offense that Germany is not more active in some kind of situations. It goes into a direction that we could certainly call uh, something like German bashing, which uh, gets a bit more popular again uh, for some reasons that are sometimes linked linked with domestic politics in, in, in particular countries. But in fact, uh, of course, there are several levels of analysis to, to, to try and understand why Germany uh, fight or the Germans fight with themselves to some extent to get more involved also as far as uh, hard power uh, politics is concerned now uh, with the rela in relation to, to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, one would be the economic and commercial interests that have been built, in fact, not only for the past uh, 30 years since the collapse of the, the USSR, but in fact, as far as uh, interactions, uh, as far as in energy policies are concerned, uh, the dependency, not only of Germany, but to some extent also of <coughs> Western Europe uh, from um, fossil energy from uh, Russia is something, the process that has started also already in the in, in the course of 1970s, yeah? and something that is is a, a, a long-term process that has started uh, that started before the end of Cold War and uh, was continued under, uh, of course, under co other conditions, but with a certain form of continuity as far as maybe part of the goals uh, uh, from the Russian side would be concerned to create a certain dependency. Uh, from the German side, of course, this was an equivalent for well, trying to have Russia changed through commerce, well, Wandel durch Handel, which is something that was very important, was uh, some sort of key to uh, uh, the success of the Neue Ostpolitik that was neu, that was new in, in, in the times of, of uh, Willy Brandt, Egon Barr, and so on. But in, in the current situation, where in fact we have a totally different Russian state uh, that uses the rhetorics of the Soviet times, but has a totally different structure and could be uh, defined rather as a kind of uh, well-organized system of kleptocracy, using uh, fossil energies as a weapon, uh, weaponizing, in fact, commerce and anything with relation to the West and try, trying to, to regain some neo-imperial influence on former territories. Uh, here we see that, uh, in fact, the, the tools that had been developed by Germany in particular in uh, their uh, relation to Russia are not efficient anymore. And uh, Germans have 
come, Germany has come as a state to this point where um, uh, the Ger Germans have understood that uh, it's not possible anymore, that those hopes uh, uh, are not uh, justified at this point. Well, of course, we have heard uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz <coughs> Uh, speaking about Zeitenwende, a real turn, uh, a real uh, change, a transformation. But of course, this kind of change cannot uh, happen all of a sudden. Well, uh, from the perspective uh, of, of uh, historical studies, we know that even change that seem to be abrupt, uh, rapid, or a kind of a process that are going through several steps. The problem is that we are living in very quick times and uh, everybody feels that there is not, not much time left for several steps. So the expectations are becoming stronger and stronger to Germany, the pressure also, because Germany in fact is uh, the most important player uh, in the European Union as far as this economy is, is concerned. And uh, well, what uh, is irritating from the perspective of the partners uh, is that uh, they observe Germany or they had been observing Germany behaving as kind of a huge Switzerland, uh, not wanting to be more present in, in international relations as far as political, military, such kind of aspect would be concerned. Another aspect that makes it more difficult, in my sense, uh, for Germany to appreciate the situation, well, it's changed, of course, and it's very valuable change, but uh, through the history of World War II and post-war and Cold War, much of <coughs> the Soviet Union was considered by Germany through the prisma of Russia. And uh, it was kind of, you know, Soviet Union is Russia, which means that after the collapse of the, United, of the, the USSR, the natural partner, uh, which is quite logical for uh, Germany, uh, as for many other countries, was Russia. But it made it all the more difficult also because of past history of, of Germany <coughs> in the first half of the 20th century to consider several important partners uh, between Russia and Germany as actually political subjects in international relations. Uh, in fact, it was paradoxically speaking maybe easier for Germany to happen and consider in fact the small Baltic states as uh, specific political agents and subjects in international relations than, for example, Ukraine. Uh, in the mental mapping of German decision makers, but if you look at some uh, inquiries and, 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 and polls uh, in, uh, in Germany, you see that it concerns uh, society at a, uh, at a larger scale. Well, uh, Ukraine is uh, not a blind spot, but uh, the, the um, the fact that Ukraine is an autonomous, independent subject with his own goals uh, and his own, its own, own choices is something that is not that easy to understand, maybe, and as a, a consequence also uh, to accept for, for, for Germans that had been fixed on and concentrated on Russia as the main player, which is quite logical if you look at the different scales and then the importance of Russia <coughs> uh, during and after uh, the uh, Soviet Union. But as for the, e the Baltic Sea region, we see that Germany, in fact, has been changing it, uh, its perspective much earlier than now. In fact, the Zeitenwende would be some thick Zeitenwende, something, a process that has been, that, that started before and goes through several steps. Ukraine is the big one now, you know, but the presence that uh, has been enhanced, uh, has been mentioned by my fourth speaker, uh, the presence of the Bundeswehr in Lithuania, in general, the, in general speaking, the implication of the Bundeswehr in the, in the southern and, and, and eastern Baltic Sea region um, uh, is something that, that is a, a reality and had, has been a reality for the past uh, couple of years. Uh, I'm speaking here from Szczecin, where uh, there is uh, the uh, multinational corps Northeast, which is a German, Polish, Danish uh, 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 corp of the NATO, well, well, where Germany has been uh, actively present for the past uh, 20 uh, some years. So Zeitenwende, of course, uh, to sum it up, expectations to Germany are, of course, understandable, but we have to take into account the fact that there have been steps before, there will be steps afterwards. The problem with the situation about Ukraine 
is that every step should happen quite quickly. Whereas in fact, uh, the problem of energy dependency from Russia to make it more difficult for, for Germany to, to act quickly in this case. Pierre, thank you very much indeed. I think you'll all agree we've had three tremendous contributions to set us off. Uh, just to say, we've already had a couple of questions coming in now, um, but I'm just going to ask uh, two points before opening it more widely. Two themes that came through what all of you said were, how do we see Russia today? Claudia made the important point at the beginning that uh, Germany has to think about who's the guilty party and uh, have to help people who are defending themselves against an aggressor. And then the second theme that's run right through is energy. So just on those two points, firstly, do you believe that there is now a consensus across German politics, including the CDU, uh, about uh, the way in which Russia should be seen? Um, to what extent is there still controversy? We can see Gerhard Schroeder still being involved in some of the discussions uh, with Gazprom in those kind of ways. Or do you believe that we are moving towards a consensus on these matters uh, within German politics, but more widely uh, across the Baltic Sea as well, in the Baltic states and Poland? And the second question to all three of you is the energy point that you've made all the way through, tied in with Pierre's final point about time. Uh, really, it's uh, we're though we are seeing a change of orientation on energy policy, creating the uh, more diverse, more resilient economies, less dependent on Russian oil and gas. Uh, the fact is that we'll have to move very quickly indeed with the big changes that Russia is moving forward. So those are the two questions. Is there a consensus now, do you think, across German politics about Russia and what we think of it? Or is it still a matter in discussion? And secondly, uh, how quickly do you think we can deal with the changing energy relationship with Russia? Claudia, I'm going to ask you to answer that question first, and then I'll come to the other two. I would say that at the moment, we have a consensus about how, to we, how we have to look upon Russia. And um, when it comes to the question, who is the partner that I worry about. It's not the it's not the CDU. The CDU is very clear on that. And um, to be honest, most of them I have been speaking to before have been clear on that also within the last coalition. Um, and there has always been, I have to say, there has always been um, the difference or the different opinions between those um, dealing with security and foreign relations and those dealing with uh, economy. Because their views, and that was across some parties, um, differed. I have to say that was true for the CDU in some parts, but even more so for our still coalition partner, the SPD. And if you honestly ask me, I still hear voices within that party that say, well, at the moment, we still, well, first of all, we have to find a diplomatic solution, not saying what it is. We have to negotiate more. And I sometimes, and that comes especially from the far left, you have something like maybe the Ukraine, ha Ukraine has some fault in this as well. So I still hear those voices, I have to say. They are not as loud as they have been before, but we still have that. And I also, so therefore I say we have a consensus at the moment. The longer the conflict will go on, and at the moment, I really have no idea how to solve that, um, how, how the situation will be, will be in a few months or even years. But let's say if we have a frozen conflict there at some point, I'm rather sure, unfortunately, that those voices saying that we have to go back to some kind of a new normal with Russia will be heard again. I mean, we have seen that after the, um, after the, the annexation of Crimea. There have been sanctions. And it did not take long until you've heard German voices in politics that said, we have to lift those sanctions again. As a matter of fact, just a month before Russia started the war in the Ukraine, you had local parliaments that um, had official um, resolutions saying, you have, we have to finish North Stream 2 and we have to take gas from that. And I mean, this was still at the time, that, that was already when we had the enhanced true presence of Russia along the borders. So therefore, I really have to say that it is um, in our responsibility, mine, but also the partners, to make sure that this is the view we have at the moment will be preserved. Because what we had in the, um, 
especially with the last years, we always had this narrative of Russia is a reliant partner for us. They have always delivered us, even within uh, the cold, uh, during the Cold War times, we have, it, it was a reliable partner when it came to, and now we are back to energy. So therefore, it was quite interesting that um, we had a statement today from uh, the spokesperson of uh, Olaf Scholz saying, we have seen now that Russia is not a re reliable partner because that changes the narrative of it is a reliable partner when it comes to energy. And I really hope that this change will go through all political parties that we have seen it is not a reliable partner. When it comes to the second question, energy, now, well, it's easy for me and being from the Green Party to say, well, to diversify and become less dependent on oil and gas in general is one of our main uh, points we have always been making. But we have also said that especially dependence from one partner is dangerous. And we have said that over many years. And at the moment, what we are trying in those uh, ministries where we are um, at, at the moment to do that as quickly as possible. Um, we have just, or we're just making contracts for several FSRUs, so floating uh, LNG storage devices, that we can then import LNG very quickly. This will all happen this year, so that we will have a less reliance, um, no, less dependence on Russia, not only oil, we are working on that as well, but also gas, so that we will be more resilient when it comes to that. But I really have to say, we have to keep up the moment and we have to make sure that the view we have on Russia at the moment will prevail. And Frederick mentioned one of Pierre Frederick mentioned one point I really have to strengthen that. When it comes to especially Middle and Eastern Europe, we have said Russia meaning the whole region. And that's especially true even for, for Eastern Germany. And saying Russia meant the former Soviet Union, and that included all the states. So this thinking in those old fears, fears was still very, very much remained. And that is something that um, is, it, I, I really say that uh, is something that still worries me because that's not, that, that's something that will not change overnight with the, with the normal people. Changing that kind of thinking in those spheres will take some time. And we have not yet even re reached that with all uh, political active people in, in, um, in responsible um, offices. And that is something um, we have to work on. Okay, thank you very much. Margarita on those two points, and then I'll come to Pierre. If you could both be slightly shorter, please. I've been not very good as chair, and uh, we've uh, got some questions beginning to come in, and I want to be able to get over to them as well. But thank you, Claudia, for that. But Margarita, what's your take on these two points? Okay, so I'll start with the, uh, with the answer on how we see Russia. So in Lithuania, the things haven't changed. We saw Russia as a potential aggressor for the years, and we see it in the same way. And we were telling to everyone that uh, Russia is a potential aggressor, and this regime is dangerous. But what we did, what we got uh, for doing this, uh, everyone was calling us one uh, issue state and you know, being too paranoid, so we were doing some steps on our own, like, uh, for instance, we understood that Russia is using energy resources as a tool of the blackmailing, to weaponizing it. So we, several years ago, we took the decision to buy the LNG terminal. So today we can say very easily, we do not belong on the Russian resources. We don't buy Russian gas. That's it, full stop. But uh, the point is that, that, you know, no one was believing uh, what we are telling. And now the prophecy has been fulfilled. So we see it in the same way. And we don't believe it's going to change very uh, soon or in general, if we would go back to the situa uh, situation back to normal. For us, the most important goal of this situation to use this crisis as an opportunity to have a regime change in Russia. Because if this regime remains after five years and the situation goes back to normal after five years, 10 years, we will be facing the same conflict somewhere around as well. So I think that it is very important to not allow 
the situation to go back to normal. And I know that there are these voices and that worries us. And I know that people are getting tired of the conflict and there is this conflict fatigue and the, when energy prices will be rising and there will be less food on the tables, Next, during the next ele elections, maybe people were, would be willing uh, more to vote to these parties who are uh, giving alternative recipes, like going back to normal. And that worries us a lot. Uh, and not only in Germany, in other countries, if you have followed the debates in France, the Macron was seen as a sort of a dangerous politician among uh, these uh, supporters of Le Pen because he was insisting on sanctions and that went against the French interest. So these, all these discussions are very dangerous. So that is one thing. The other point is uh, ability to re, uh, reconstruct the energy policies uh, to diminish the dependence on Russian energy resources. So we did it. So I think that it's a good example for other countries. And I know it doesn't have, uh, it can be overnight. It's a long-term process and it can have uh, short-term repercussions like growing, increasing energy prices and uh, 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 economic stagnation. But it's, it is very important to do that. And I think that what is important is to do this also on the European level try to, again, use this crisis as an opportunity to connect this aim of uh, withdrawing from the dependency on Russian energy resources and also implementing the Green Deal. And this is a wonderful opportunity, which is disguised as a crisis. And I think for the Greens, that could be one of the um, important aims that uh, you can, or you, you can take it as a flag and go it through the Europe and say that, you know, it's also about the future of climate and things like that. Thank you very much, Margarita. By the way, I, I misread earlier on, we can go on a bit longer than I've been fearing so that we can talk and get the questions in as well. Um, uh, Pierre, on those two points. Yeah, uh, I, I will ask with, <clears throat> I'll start with the question concerning uh, whether there is uh, <clears throat> a common view in, in, in Germany about uh, the meaning of Russia and the, 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 the role and the threat Russia represents for not only for Ukraine very precisely and, and directly now, but for for the European Union, for <clears throat> the interest of, of our countries. Uh, well, I think that a, a part of maybe one party, uh, which, which of course uh, the, the RFD is a particular uh, is in a particular position in the in the <clears throat> political landscape uh, uh, in Germany, uh, and the uh, RFD is also one uh, one of the the the, the, the sources of. Uh, still existing, uh, I don't want to say Russia, Russophilia, but maybe even Kreml, Kremlophilia in, 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 in Germany. Uh, and it's something that you can observe, in fact, in many populist parties or movements throughout Europe, as far as, as France is concerned. For example, uh, my first speaker has mentioned uh, the, the, the Rassemblement National, so the <coughs> part around uh, Mrs. Le Pen. It's very clear, other parties, uh, uh, on the on the far right are, are very very uh, pro Russian in a in a way which means more pro Putin, uh, which has several roots. It can be out of a, 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 a mere anti Americanism, which is something quite present, for example, in France, where there is an anti Americanist tradition to some extent. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's something that can be observed also in in Germany, as far as it is concerned, especially in this former former uh, Eastern German uh, uh, Bundesländer, so in, in the former GDR, let's say. But it doesn't mean that in the former FRG or old FRG, they are not present either. Uh, what I <coughs> would add, what I uh, think I, we can observe, and which is very interesting, uh, it's not just a question of parties. I would say, again, from a historical perspective, it's, a, it's much more, it starts becoming much more a question of generation. Uh, if you look at something that can seem to be, uh, well, puzzling or astonishing that, in fact, the more uh, actively uh, speaking for uh, help uh, toward uh, Ukraine are politicians from the Green Party in Germany. Well, in fact, 
It may be puzzling if you consider the past tradition of pacifism in the Green Movement. But if you consider the question, not as far as parties, ideologies and so are concerned, but from the generational point of view, uh, who speaks out uh, the most uh, consequently and the most uh, the, the strongest uh, on this way? Uh, younger politicians, politicians that have not been involved directly or have not experienced all this part of, let's say, German angst, German fears, post-war fears concerning uh, the, 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 the nuclearization of Europe, the threat of uh, well nuclear death uh, and so on uh, uh, politicians that are new to 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 the the russian policy the, po the german policy toward russia and the east too politicians that had not had not been involved in all these movements of the 70s the 80s and so on which gives them a fresh look on it uh, things that are not possible uh, for both party and generational reasons, maybe uh, right now in uh, for, for leading uh, leading uh, decision makers within the SPD, for example. Well, if you look at the older generation of those are decision makers now in the party and have also important functions in the new government, starting with, <coughs> in fact, uh, today's uh, chancellor, for example, but many very important politicians within the SPD, they, to some extent, have at least uh, for some time could uh, have been able to experience this, this past SPD uh, stance about Ostpolitik and so on, that has been uh, part of their, let's say, political socialization too. And it's, it's also difficult to get out of this. I'm not speaking about specific cases like, you know, uh, Gerhard Schröder, which is, uh, of course, a, a, a particular case and a problem, I think, for the SPD especially. But uh, it's, it's a question that is, uh, as far as I consider, is, uh, that can be considered also uh, generationally speaking. And that the change is possible for younger politicians to go out of this German angst of, uh, that, that has been, uh, in fact, one of the main uh, aspects why Germany has stick to, uh, stuck to, 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 to their position to uh, try and not get engaged in conflict, to not uh, profile uh, themselves as being part of conflict, taking sides, be militarily speaking active and present because of the past and so on. So this fresh look is for sure very important for Germany, for Europe, and for the Eastern and, uh, and, and Central Eastern European partners that have those, those expectations to, to Germany. Thank that you, Pierre. And for, for that angle, that's very helpful. We've, got, we've actually got a question coming in in a moment about the relationship <laughs> with us politique of this whole process, which will be interesting. But I'm just going to go straight now to the questions which have been submitted. And the first one is from... Jörg Hackman from Stitching University, um, who says that on a panel organized by the Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies some weeks ago, the point was made that security of the three Baltic states has significantly increased since the Russian attack on Ukraine. And he asked, do we agree with that? Do we agree that security of the Baltic states has increased since the Russian attack on Ukraine? Let me come first to you, Margarita. What do you think of that uh, question? Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good question. And I already saw this question previously on the chat and tried to scribble some notes regarding it. It's always, you know, you either have a glass of or half full or half empty. But talking about the increased uh, security situation, because we uh, got some additional reinforcements, uh, air policemen, uh, po policing, also additional troops, and better understanding of what Russia is, while talking about this, we have to remember also that uh, there is, in general, a very decreased security uh, situation in the region. And Russia is not only uh, threatening or massing, but it's fighting. So we have a war very close to our borders. So I wouldn't say that the security situation has increased. There were some steps to reassure us, which were made, but it is still a long way to uh, go in terms of uh, 
getting the same balance, which was prior to war with enhanced forward presence battalions and other reinforcements, uh, which were introduced after Wales and the Warsaw NATO summit. So what, uh, what uh, we are looking for, uh, we are looking for uh, uh, different, uh, several different things. First of all, uh, reconceptualization of the defense presence in the region. Uh, we had enhanced forward presence, so this, these forces were to ensure, these forces were considered rather as a tripwire and were to ensure defense by punishment rather than uh, defense by denial. And with this new security situation, we are hoping to have the defense by uh, denial or if forward defense. We need more forces that we would not be faced with a situation when Russia just attacks and makes the situation fait accompli and we are uh, occupied again. Because of course you can always doubt if Russia would uh, uh, dare to uh, attack NATO, but you know, we didn't think that this conflict would be, this uh, war on Ukraine would be possible. So things are, the things have changed. Everything is possible now. So for us, it is very important to change the concept, to have more defense, uh, rather deterrence on the ground. And that's about the legal things, about the chains of command, about the command structures, about more troops. And uh, I think, I remember after the Crimea in 2014 or 15, there was a analysis made by RAND, which, were t uh, which was telling that in order to ensure defense by denial in the Baltic countries and Poland, we need seven brigades. So we probably are not talking the forces that big because it's very costly and I'm not sure that uh, NATO countries are able to give the defense of that level for us, but at least a brigade in each country, I think that's that's what we're looking for uh, uh, in the in, in, in the uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claudia, do you think that the security of the three Baltic states has significantly increased? since the Russian attack on Ukraine? It's really a diff difficult question. And um, I would neither say yes nor no, because um, you cannot simply answer that. I would definitely say that the focus on the question of security of the Baltic states has increased. So we focus on that. We taking the threats that have been voiced to us seriously. And of course that, can give greater security. But on the other hand, we see that, I mean, Russia is not accomplishing its goals in the Ukraine at the moment. So we do not know what that will do to Putin, what um, his next reactions will be. And if, for example, he gets some kind of um, gain from that conflict, from that war, in any case, what will that do to him? Will it, um, will it be, um, Will it be seen as um, a way for him to maybe get his goals in other areas as well? So maybe will there be a new threat to the Baltic states after the, the Ukraine war? Because th that really will depend on the outcome of the war, really. How he, what, what the outcome will be will determine how, on what his next steps will be. And looking on that, we also have to take a look on what he's doing or what the Russian troops are doing in Moldova at the moment. So that we also have to take into perspective. And the question is whether sending troops is something that is, um, well, he, he, he whether he gains something from that. And as long as he comes out with territorial gains, I would not say that security has increased for the Baltic states. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to Pierre to answer this question next, but I'm going to, to join it with the uh, a second question which has come, which takes a slightly broader look from Donatus Kupsiunas, who's my colleague at the Center for Geopolitics in Cambridge. And he asks, there's been some evidence that just before the war, Germany was looking for ways to avoid ex escalation and pressed Ukraine to agree 
to some of Russia's demands, such as dropping its insistence on NATO membership. Now that Russia has invaded Ukraine, did Germany renounce its policy of trying to accommodate Russian interests? And is it now in favour of an Iron Curtain separating Europe and Russia? So, Pierre, if you could deal with that question and any comments you want to make about the security or otherwise of the Baltic states having been increased, that would be great. Then I'll come back to the other panellists. Well, uh, I would say that uh, if we look at uh, the, uh, let's say, the aims and the results so far for <coughs> Vladimir Putin, uh, well, uh, he has managed uh, several things that uh, nobody had managed so far. Uh, in fact, uh, as far as Ukraine is concerned, and this is not much of an interest for his policy, uh, Ukraine, uh, because of the current situation, has maybe never been so much united before. So uh, we, we had been always speaking about the Western Ukraine that is more Ukrainian and, and, and Western oriented or oriented toward the West and the Russian speaking Eastern part of Ukraine that is more looking uh, at Russia and the, the risk of splitting the country with this uh, centrifugal uh, forces on one side, of course, uh, harder from Russia's side or maybe, maybe softer from the U EU side. Well, Right now, what we can observe is that uh, after <coughs> uh, 24th of February, uh, Ukraine uh, has been uh, stronger united than ever before. That's the first point. Another uh, anti-success maybe of, of those uh, <coughs> of this aggression uh, war uh, by uh, Russia is that uh, we're observing something that is of huge or at least very important, very high interest to the Baltic Sea region is that two neutral states so far are starting considering or, or concretely are, are really considering joining NATO, Sweden and Finland, which was not to be imagined uh, even a couple of months uh, before, or at least years before. And uh, what, uh, well, of course, not uh, directly, but indirectly through this Vladimir Putin is achieving is getting NATO uh, about 150 kilometers from Petersburg, which is not really a success either. So uh, from this uh, perspective, <clears throat> I would say that, of course, threats have increased through the aggression war against Ukraine, have increased for the whole eastern central region, have increased, of course, for those countries that uh, are living in the strongest uh, relation of asymmetry with regards to Russia, having at the same time a common border with Russia. And here, I mean, of course, states like Lithuania, uh, uh, Latvia, and Estonia. But at the same time, we're observing new steps, uh, a really quick evolution in this area of the Baltic Sea in particular, <coughs> uh, that shows that mm, paradoxically, maybe security is going to be stronger or being higher or, or, or greater for, uh, uh, for those Baltic states. For example, because of the extension of NATO territory all around, basically almost all around the Baltic Sea uh, uh, in, the, in the Baltic Sea region. So, in fact, maybe uh, indirectly or in a, in a second step uh, be beyond the, the, the observed uh, direct threat we observe uh, uh, after uh, February the 24th, uh, security for those countries, uh, as far as Russia will kept will be kept down as a threat later, uh, security uh, would be increased, uh, in my opinion. So uh, it's what I could add to this, not, not trying not to make it too long in my answer. Thank you very much indeed, Pierre. Uh, <coughs> Claudia, on this question of uh, whether German politics favours an iron curtain separating Europe and Russia, uh, obviously with a different uh, location than the historic Iron Curtain. Uh, how do you see that? I mean, it's uh, very difficult to judge, as we've said, Russian attitudes in the future, but how do you see that possibility, Claudia? Well, I really don't like to, to hear the word Iron Curtain or the words Iron Curtain as one from the former east of Germany <laughs> that does not bring good back, that does not bring back good memories. Um, what I would like to see really is that we take for that, that we take seriously that countries, I would say, between the German and Russian borders have a right 
to decide for themselves and that we have to help them protect those rights. I mean, that's that's just the basic law, really. And we have one player at the moment who does not agree to the, the rules of world society. I'm not in favor of an Iron Curtain. I would be in favor of a peace that means that Ukraine keeps its complete and total integrity. Um, but at the moment, I, I'm not seeing that really. So the question is, can we move towards that? And um, as it was said, if there is a regime change, we might have a chance for that. We might have a chance for a different um, situation in the region. But I'm not very optimistic on that at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing that. I mean, we have, of course, it is difficult to say how real those um, numbers from, from Russia are, how many people um, are in favor of this politics at the moment and even in favor of this uh, war, even though it's not called that way. I mean, the last number said 82% in Russia are in favor of, of the situation at the moment. And it's difficult to believe, but you hear a lot of voices and we are also seeing a change that in the beginning there were protests against it. We are not seeing any protests at the moment, of course, because they are very, they are very hardly sanctioned. People go to prison very quickly. I really don't see the, that big of an opposition that will overthrow Putin at the moment. And that is really the only chance we would be having at, right now to not to have a frozen conflict, not to have what you called an iron curtain. I'm not in favor of that. I don't want that. But on the other hand, I definitely want to protect the security of, uh, the, of other European states. Thank you, Claudia. Margarita, how do you see this question? Uh, I agree with Claudia. Iron Co Curtain, I don't think it's a situation that we should agree with. And definitely it doesn't have to be at the uh, on the border of Ukraine. And Ukraine has a chance to become a part of Europe. And especially now when they were sh uh, demonstrating so clearly how they are, how much they are willing to fight for their freedom. And uh, it's uh, if we decide that Ukraine has to be left somewhere in the gray zone just because Putin wants, I think that it's going to be demoralizing many people in Europe in general uh, because it's injustice. It's, 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 it's injustice. It's not just. And it says something about the international system, about the institu our international institutions and about our politicians in the uh, European countries that this injustice is okay with us. So I think it's it's not a not a, not a deal, but in terms of the regime change, I agree, Claudia, that it's not an easy task and it's not going to happen fast, because yes, although the numbers are frauded and people are afraid, uh, I think that the, the society. Uh, will not, uh, if there will be a regime change, it will not come from the society, at least for now. But the th situation might change after some time if the economic sanctions would start working, like really hampering Russian economy. And those people in the big cities, in the factories, would start being unha unhappy, not the creative class in Moscow or in St. Petersburg, but the people in factories. So that might uh, shake a bit uh, the confidence of the regime or the regime change could come from, from within. That's also an, uh, a possible scenario. But for now, I think it is very important to keep Ukrainians fighting and to deliver arms that the Russians would be pushed as far as it is possible because the final uh, outcome of this war would be decided in the field, not in the negotiations, the country that has more victories would be dictating uh, the uh, general uh, um, agreement or negotiations. And for us, I hope that it's going to be Ukraine. And we have to help Ukraine to do that. It's a very interesting and difficult conversation that we've been having because it requires some sense of what the future of the governance of Russia is going to be. And the point uh, that Claudia made about one very important player not accepting general international rules and then what do you do about it has been a very central question. 
Uh, our third question um, is more about some of the history and the strategic attitudes, but can I just, before I uh, read it out, uh, encourage other questions to come in if people would like to table them for the last 10 or 15 minutes of our session. This question is from Alexander Drost at uh, Greifswald University. And he says, taking up on Margarita's comment on the slow decision-making processes and Claudia's mentioning of change in the Foreign Office in Germany, combined with the historical perspective of Pierre, the question he asks is, is the legacy of Ostpolitik responsible for the delays or rather the wrong assessment of the security situation in the Baltic Sea region due to the open borders and peace narrative since 1989, 1991. He's really saying, was Ostpolitik a terrible mistake in terms of all this because it's generated attitudes towards Russia which are wrong. I must say, I'd find it rather difficult if we came to that conclusion. I've always myself felt Ostpolitik was a very important strategy for change at that time, but of course, we're in a new time. So Margarita, what do you think about the importance, the legacy of Ostpolitik to the way people thought about these problems? For us, uh, again, I, I, uh, I would give the perspective of Lithuania and we were always criticizing this uh, Ostpolitik of Germany uh, on one hand, uh, having uh, much uh, belief that uh, Russia uh, could be a reliable partner, what uh, Claudia was already mentioning at the beginning, that it has been reliable partner. It was support, uh, giving the uh, uh, resources, supplying Germany with the resources, so all, even during the Cold War. So I think that this premise for us was not acceptable because we have entirely different history with Russia. So for us, it has never been a reliable partner. And I think that that's why we believe that this premise that Germany was making was not, uh, not, not uh, just, and it might change at some point what we see now. Another important uh, mistake I think in German foreign policy was that there was a belief that you can democratize Russia by trading with it, with it. And I think we were also telling this that it's not gonna work like that because Russia, before democratizing, it has to get rid of imperial thinking. It has to become nation state. Until this is done, there is no way for the democratization in Russia. So again, we were criticizing this. And another important issue, um, uh, I remember I was having some projects with Eastern partnership policy. Uh, policy. And for me, it, is, it was always, you know, a bit insulting even when Germany was seeing, you know, this region as one region with Russia as a major player. And it doesn't, didn't see Russia as the country who were hampering the security of this region and that it has to listen to those countries as well. So I think that was the third very big mistake which was made by Germany. But now I, I, I can see some changes and I'm very hopeful unless you know these radical voices would come to power. Thank you very much, uh, Marguerite. Pierre, how do you see this question of the historic significance or otherwise of Ostpolitik? Well, I, I very much agree with, with what Margaret uh, has, say, has just said about <clears throat> imperial thinking and getting rid about this imperial thinking. It's something that we can observe, of course, uh, quite visibly in, 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 in the, the Russian uh, uh, powers uh, speech, but something that has not been completely absent also in, in the discourse of uh, some politicians that had, had, had the ability to provide themselves as um, opposition politicians to the, 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 the Russian power. You maybe can remember that even uh, uh, res uh, a respectable uh, person like uh, Alexander Navalny has been credited sometimes uh, uh, kind of uh, nationalist or strongly patriotic Russian views that not necessarily took into account the point of view of uh, you know, states, partners, nations, west to uh, Russia, uh, uh, between Russia and, and the European Union, especially, so Ukraine and so on. So it's something that sticks more, um, let's say, deeper in, 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 in the Russian co political culture. 
and, and which is uh, uh, the, one of the main problems in, in, in the long path to democratization. What I would like to <coughs> add here is that apart from specifically maybe German uh, um, illusions or, or, or German uh, 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 misinterpretations about what we can expect from or what can we can or, or what can or what we can bring Russia to. Um, well, it was part of a, a wider, broader Western uh, illusion. Uh, the idea that, uh, or the assumption that, that Russia, after uh, 1991, wanted to get Westernized in a way that did not imply only money, economy, commerce, but also political culture, the rule of law, uh, a specific view of open society and so on and so on. And uh, this was accompanied by something that has been perceived, experienced for the past 30 years until now. If we observe it from inside, <laughs> even being like say a Westerner, but in, in Central Eastern Europe, I'm speaking for myself, that has been experienced by many, uh, well, uh, common citizens, but also experts and <laughs> researchers as a, a not very uh, uh, nice way of West explaining. So that in, in fact, not taking into account the view of those that had had a different experience with Russia because of history, because of geopolitics, because of geography and so on, and trying to uh, uh, have them accept our Western view on Russia, telling them that we know better. And in fact, we know what's going on and that the future of Russia is to get westernized. And in fact, they, they deeply want it. And this was maybe the greatest misinterpretation uh, because <coughs> it, 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 it would not take into account a very important aspect uh, collectively working in societies. And that is often, uh, well, <coughs> forgotten about is that uh, societies as individuals, of course, not exactly the same way, but live through emotions, through collective emotions. And the main collective emotion in Russia, not only about among decision makers after 91, was a, 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 an emotion uh, well, of, of shame after the collapse of the United States, of, of, of uh, getting, uh, uh, well, uh, losing its, 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 their status as, as a great power and so on and so on. And uh, it was an illusion thinking that Russia would just like accept getting, let's say, colonized by the Western idea or the Western way of living and so on without mm -hmm. trying to put their own norms into the basket. Uh, that's what I, I would like to add maybe as, as, as a, Thank you. an additional that's, thought to it. It is an interesting thought, Pierre. Uh, which is very relevant as we try and think what are Russian motivations now. Claudia, how do you see Ostpolitik in uh, retrospect? Um, to do it very, very quickly. I don't think it was a mistake, but the situation was completely different. I mean, Willy Brandt, Egon Bar, they were dealing with the Soviet Union. They had to look at the Soviet Union. And um, as we remember, his uh, kneeling, his famous kneeling was in Warsaw. It was not in Moscow. Um, so he, in that time, also saw very clearly it's not just the Soviet Union, it's also the other Eastern state part of the uh, yeah, Soviet bloc in one way, but he saw that as different. And also what we are not to forget is um, in that time, military spending in uh, Germany certainly did not decrease. So that was going hand in hand as well. Um, so it certainly was not a mistake back in that time. Unfortunately, what happened, uh, especially in the late 1990s, um, and I really would have to say in the early 1990s, um, and now I have to say something positive about the, um, the coalition in the uh, early 1990s about Helmut Kohl. We had a, a government that really saw themselves as the ones helping and um, especially the Poland and the Baltic State to come into NATO, to come into the European Union. And that changed at one point. It changed somehow with a change of government. And the view was then someone different. And you said the Handel durch Wandel was, was mentioned that we really believe that by increasing trade, they would at one point adopt our ideas. By the way, there was also the idea when it comes to China. We have seen that it, that's not working. It's simply not working. Handel durch Wandel is not 
working with these regimes because they do not want to be democratized. At least the leaders will don't want that. And so therefore, simply trading with them, with them is not helping change. And that's probably one of the things that, especially in the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, was simply a misbelief. We, we, we have seen that now. Um, and I think both of you, um, you, you said most of it, so I just simply wanted to add these ideas. So in, back in the time, it was not a mistake, but it was a different idea. And we have not really, we have not continued to develop it, especially develop it into seeing the different players in the region as individuals, not seeing the big block as it has been during Soviet times. I think, Claudia, your description raises a very sharp question indeed, which I don't suggest we go to in length now. But if it is the case that trade doesn't change things, that raises very sharply the question, what does change things in terms of different societies and so on? And that's a big, big challenge. Uh, I've, we've got three more questions. I'm going to take two of them immediately together from Brendan Sims at the uh, Centre for Geopolitics in Cambridge, who says, uh, how has Germany coped with the fact that Angela Merkel's reputation, in his opinion, is heavily damaged and that post-Brexit UK, supposedly isolated, says Brendan, has emerged as a major player and much lauded by Ukraine itself. It's been a bit of a surprise to some of us in politics in Britain to see a Boris Johnson street being set up uh, in Ukraine. And then Margit Busman from uh, Greifswald University uh, has a question which overlaps with this. Uh, do you prefer Germany's role as security provider rather within the NATO uh, uh, within the NATO framework or within a European security ar architecture, what added benefits could you see from the EU's defence policy? And this is an enormous question about the relative roles of NATO on the one hand and the EU on the other, uh, obviously informed also with Emmanuel Macron's re-election yesterday. So uh, how is Germany dealing with Angela Merkel's reputation? What are people thinking about post-Brexit UK? And is it NATO or the EU, which is the place where uh, there should be a focus on seeing how we develop security in the Baltic Sea region? Uh, do you want to kick us off on this, Margarita? And any reflections you've got on this would be of interest. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to think of something very fast. Uh, first of all, the UK role, uh, yeah, the exit of the UK from the EU for us in the region was a major challenge and uh, we were very unhappy about that because UK for a number of years was uh, our, one of the major security partners in the region or also our biggest ally on a number of the issues in the European Union. We were always looking what the UK would say and then the, in the Baltics and Baltic Nordic community we would vote very much in lines what the UK was doing. When UK uh, uh, went away of exited uh, the European Union, uh, it exited. It doesn't participate in the decision making. So naturally, we are looking for other uh, partners. And so there are two big uh, players, France and Germany. And uh, well, for, for a number of reasons, we look to Germany as a major uh, uh, major political partner, major regional leader on the European Union issue. So that's within the European Union. But UK remains a security partner in NATO and the security player in the region because UK has a very strong um, armed forces and also very strong um, strategic culture um, the strategic culture which is ready to fight and for us it's very important because if you compare German strategic culture which is evolving now I hope uh, and, and, and UK strategic culture so the UK strategic culture is more uh, ready to uh, stand against the Russian, Russian threat. So, and plus the decision making in the UK is faster not uh, in, uh, uh, than in the European Union. So that was a moment for Boris Johnson to shine. I'm not sure that he will keep this moment because EU is becoming a very important player in the region, not 
due, uh, because of the defense issues, but at the end of the day, the conflict will be over and the, there will be a need to rebuild the Ukraine. There will be a need to, to also build up the economy and the EU will be playing a main role there. So I'm not so sure that the EU, uh, Boris Johnson will keep this opportunity to shine in the long term. And German uh, cooperation with Germany in, uh, in defense uh, through NATO or the EU, we prefer in the form that we have now uh, through NATO. And for us, uh, in terms of uh, defense, NATO is the main, the primary organization. But we also see the role uh, uh, for the EU. And I think that uh, after the elections in France, there will be more cooperation between Germany and the EU in building European defense uh, capabilities, cooperating in the European Union and buying and building these cap capabilities together. Because what we see now that uh, it's not the lack of money in the European Union that prevents of increasing European military capabilities, but the, every, every country is doing on its own. So there are like 26 different tank systems in Europe. So that, that hampers the interoperability and ability to defend Europe, Europe. So there is also the role of Germany within the EU in building defense capabilities because Germany is the country which is pushing European defense security policy to build the capabilities, whereas French has a, uh, have a bit different uh, goal with the European security and defense policy. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. Uh, Claudia, what do you think of these questions? Well, especially with the question of whether within the NATO framework or in within a European framework, I can completely uh, agree with Margarita, especially saying that we are, we do need a better cooperation within the European Union when it comes to security and defense policies, um, that we need the systems to work together much better, as, as we have it in, in NATO, of course, but we need a better um, cooperation within the European Union when it comes to that subject. And that would also mean that we could um, have our spending more efficient because it's not just how much we spend it, but how we spend it. And uh, especially within Germany, that is a big question. We're not, I would say we're not the most efficient when it comes to that. Um, and then the other question, um, the role of Boris Johnson and the UK, um, that really doesn't bother us because they are still a very important partner within NATO. And as it is a security issue, it, NATO is, is the main player. So um, we are quite happy that also the UK is taking a big role in that. And when it comes to the role of Angela Merkel, I have to say that uh, in current policies, we are not really much concerned with her reputation in the world. At the moment, we are more looking on the active politicians that had been active in that time as well. Uh, for example, our president, uh, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, and his reputation, and the question what were their responsibilities? And I mean, the state you mentioned, I'm from Rostock so I'm, and the state I'm from, uh, for example, our state prime minister, um, Mrs. Schwesig, who has been taken an extremely active role and her, his, her predecessor, uh, Mr. Zellering as well. So looking at their roles and especially on how much they might have been influenced and therefore local governments and maybe even more have been influenced by Russia. And I mean, this is a this, this discussion we, we're having at the moment, and I've, I would say it has still has to pick up because the question on how much Russia influenced standing governments is a question we really have to ask ourselves. And that's a, again, a question of resilience. And um, we have to learn from that. And we have to see how much dairy when narratives were taken over into German politics. And um, well, it, it, it's really easy to say, well, I, I've always said it, but in this case, it's really true. I've, I, I was often very much uh, shocked how much what I heard from other politicians was what you basically heard from Russian media and it's, they didn't even notice. And that's really something that we have to have a very, very close look on and we have to become more resilient to that. So Angela Merkel, really, that's not my main concern at the moment. I'm looking at the still current politicians. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, you're, I, I'm, I'm, I've got one other question, but I don't think we're going to be able to get around to it, unfortunately. Uh, so, Pierre, I think you're going to have the last word before I uh, finally uh, wind it up. What are your comments on these questions? NATO, EU, Merkel, Boris Johnson? 
Yeah, so I, I would say that uh, it's clear that NATO is, is a security, uh, security, uh, let's say, a guarantee number one for all the whole region of Central and Eastern Europe. It's something that even in, in, in Western European capitals, uh, the decision makers are aware of. You remember the, the shocking words by uh, maybe back in those times, not so far away, uh, by uh, President uh, Emmanuel Macron, who said that we are we are experiencing uh, NATO's brain death. It was nothing that uh, Macron or France was happy with. It was a, a diagnosis, something that was going wrong with NATO. So maybe uh, even if France uh, for itself and for Europe has special, special ambitions as for European defense, uh, sensible decision makers in France are aware of the fact that it's a long way to go. And that uh, in, in fact, the only real guarantee right now is still NATO. It's nothing, nothing that uh, we're supposed to get rid of or, or to resign from. So <coughs> we should also remember uh, the words of uh, 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 former Polish uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Radosław Sikorski, who said about Germany uh, about 10 years ago that he was fearing more Germany that will not engage enough than a Germany that engages too much. So we see that Eastern European partners, as far as Germany is concerned, are thinking far uh, more uh, progressively than uh, so far Germans, in fact, would even for themselves do about their role in the world. So this is an important point. And I think that uh, as far as European defense is concerned, it's something to be done, but it, it cannot be uh, beside or in, against NATO so far. In fact, there is no sense in it. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said a second ago, I've got one other pair of questions which I'm not going to put because I think it takes us down, we don't have the time for it, from Miklos Lazar asking about Ostpolitik and trade and how things will move forward. So I apologise to Mr Lazar that I haven't been able to take his question. But I do want to thank the panellists, all three of you, for what I think has been an exceptionally interesting conversation, a very valuable one indeed. Um, I hope that the collaboration that we have at Cambridge with Greifswald University will be able to develop and promote further discussions of these kinds of things uh, and to take it forward in various ways. I think it's been a tremendously interesting event this afternoon. And thank you to all three of you for your outstanding contributions uh, to our discussion. Many thanks again.